How are we doing, guys? I wanted to talk a little bit today about what's going to come to be known as the New South and whether or not we can actually remember or refer to it as new. So think about that continuity and changes over time in the South and whether or not we should actually remember the South as making any real shifts after the Civil War and after Reconstruction or if really it all just stayed the same. So for once, I actually want you to read your primary document first, if you haven't done that yet. So take a look at Henry Grady's The New South. Henry Grady puts forward this idea of a new industrial South, a South that is stronger than ever before, that rivals the North, um, and that is no longer held back by being an only agricultural uh, society. And so I want you to think about where you're doing that is whether or not that's a real possibility um, what steps need to be taken, and whether or not you think that's actually going to come true. Um, because everything we do throughout today, throughout looking at this, um, this PowerPoint, is based on this idea of whether or not the South actually changed. So in that post-Civil War economy in the South, we know for a fact that in the Civil War, the South has been decimated. Right? They've lost much of their railroads. Sherman's march to the sea has been extremely destructive to much of their infrastructure um, and much of their railroads, many of their factories even in places like Atlanta. Um, so they're going to have to find a way if they want to move towards a new south or a new industrial south to recover beyond that. So in the post-Civil War economy, they start to shift towards that. They got with, through government subsidies, through increase in government help from the north. Um, we see a lot of growing industry throughout the South, especially in cities like Alabama. And in places like North Carolina, we begin to see um, textile mills pop up. Um, so some of these larger industrial centers today that you think of in the South, um, they really started that directly after the Civil War. Right? Places like Alabama and Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte, areas like that. Um, many of these areas in the South are also going to even pull people away from the North even. Um, Northerners who could not find a job were able to go to, towards um, many areas in the South and find work. Um, in addition, areas in the South are very ideal for places to put factories because you can get very cheap labor. Right? There's not going to be a whole lot of un union organization. You've got your raw materials right there. So it's a great opportunity for northern businesses to move south as well. Um, people in the south often experience much lower wages. It's much dirtier, worse conditions than in their north, which by no means are high quality. Um, so areas in the south are more dangerous, difficult um, but that's the still how they get, have to get started in their industry. And so they are still moving in the direction of becoming more industrialized. Um, so many Southerners who never had an opportunity before, um, and many freedmen even, now have an opportunity to work and an opportunity for an advancement that wouldn't have been there before the Civil War. So let's remember quickly how Reconstruction comes to a close. Remember, so remember that everything, all the major important uh, vocabulary pops up in those first couple years from 1865 to 1868. You've got amendments, you've got all kinds of things happening. But by the mid-1870s, um, Northerners, Republicans, and abolitionists um, are starting to be challenged by Democrats once again and are starting to lose their interest in spending money and spending taxpayer dollars um, and supporting things like the Freedmen's Bureau to, to protect freedmen in the South. Um, and so by 1877, we see the official close of Reconstruction, or 1877, the corrupt bargain is at SFI. Um, and with that, we see a new president come into play. Rutherford B. Hayes takes the presidency in what is known as this corrupt bargain um, because they could not decide the, elect the Electoral College. It was too close in too many states um, to name Hayes or to name an outright winner. And so in what is known as the backroom deal, the corrupt bargain, Rutherford B. Hayes and the Republicans um, maintain control of the presidency under the promise that um, in exchange they get a full removal of troops from the South. Right? Remember that military reconstruction, no more troops in the South, um, which means, unfortunately, that these redeemers, right, those Southerners who want to return it back to the old ways, are going to be in charge and in command once again. So 
um, this period of 1877 forward is unfortunately a dark era marked by almost total disenfranchisement of freedmen. So those major events that we mentioned in the last slide, um, we talked about the 13th Amendment, the Freedmen's Bureau, the Civil Rights Act, 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, um, and even I would add another one, the Radical Reconstruction Act. All of those happened in those first couple years. The 13th Amendment bans slavery, 14th gives equal citizenship, we remember that's a crucial term. 15th Amendment gives full voting right for black males, remember females still not allowed to vote. And the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which gives citizenship, um, but isn't guaranteed in amendment form until the 14th. So these are the basic protections of Reconstruction. But remember, with 1877 and that um, corrupt bargain, you have a total removal of troops from the South, which means there's no more protections of these. And so... For the next 50 to really almost 100 years, the South would find ways to slowly overturn each one of these, which is what we'll be going over here. So first we'll go over discrimination specifically in the courts. Okay. Their first major event after, this, after the corrupt bargain and the end of Reconstruction are what's known as the civil rights cases. This is five different cases that the Supreme Court heard all of at the same time and just referred to as the civil rights cases. And what they essentially ruled was is that Congress lacked the authorities and they did not have the authority to outlaw racial discrimination. Right? So Congress does not have the authority to tell someone they're not allowed to discriminate if, if, and this is important, they are a private individual or organization, right? So state and local governments still did not have the right to discriminate, but private individuals, right? Private individuals or private organizations now have the ability to tell someone you cannot eat here because of blank, the color of your skin, your gender, something like that. So um, the Constitution in these civil rights cases allow discrimination in the South and allow um, segregation. And the first time that's really challenged is in 1896, um, in one of, if not the most famous Supreme Court case, uh, that one of the most important cases you're going to need to know this year, absolutely know and understand Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, this is a crucial case in civil rights history and discrimination in post-civil rights era. So Homer Plessy, this, into this strikingly good-looking fellow right here, was one-eighth black, one-eighth African-American, and he sits in, an, in a white-only railroad coach. Okay? Um, because of that, because of his one-eighth heritage, um, he is not allowed to sit in that area, is arrested, and takes his case all the way to the Supreme Court. Right. All Southern courts rule that they were correct, that the policemen were correct, and so he takes it and challenges it all the way to the Supreme Court, who then says in one of the most crucial rulings in U.S. history, separate but equal facilities are okay. As long as they are equal, as long as there is a bathroom for both races, it's okay. As long as there is somewhere for the other race to eat, that's okay. And that it, in many ways, allows segregation. It allows discrimination. Plessy v. Ferguson legalizes that and is going to be the law of the land for almost 60 more years. Outside of the courts in the actual legal system, um, the South especially, but even some northern areas, put into place things known as Jim Crow laws. This is all another really good SFI term. Jim Crow, named after this fellow, an actor, Thomas Rice, um, who acted in blackface um, as an stereotyped and exaggerated African American. And so the, the Jim Crow laws were put into place in many ways to separate um, the whites in the South from what they saw as the inferior race. And that comes in two ways that you both need to know. You need to understand both de jure and de facto types of segregation. The difference is de jure is the legal system, jure, think jury, and facto is just a fact, the way it is. So de jure segregation is legally saying the races must, must go to different public schools, must have different public places, 
must have different public transportation, segregation of restrooms, restaurants, drinking fountains, um, all of these things, and even the U.S. military. Right? We often don't think about that, and the military is going to remain segregated until after World War II. Right? So the these Jim Crow laws were put into place to further separate um, whites from blacks. And in contrast to that is de facto segregation, which is more naturally occurring. Um, and we see a lot of that still today. Right? It's separation of races in housing or schools, the requirements to live. The nicer neighborhoods um, in the South were de facto naturally going to fall to um, whites because the, the African Americans, freedmen in the South, didn't have opportunities uh, to find a job or to work somewhere that could allow them to move into that type of neighborhood. Discrimination um, and disenfranchisement didn't just happen in the legal system or in the courts. It also and maybe most prominently happened at the polls. Okay, so the ability to vote was taken away by numerous different things, including literacy tests, impossible tests that could not be passed. And past tests that an African American or a freeman would have to take, and the person that was overseeing the voting booth was then the judge of that test. They graded the test, and if they didn't like the person, they could tell them, well, you didn't pass, or you missed a question, right? that no one could pass. These literacy tests that seemed only whites could pass. The poll taxes, um, or is it making people pay to vote, right? This is eventually going to be outlawed um, later on by the 16th Amendment, uh, would, rec would completely remove poll taxes. But um, at this time, poll taxes really kept African Americans, but even poor whites, from voting as well. Residency requirements, whatever part of town you lived in, made sure whether you could or could not vote, and even grandfather clauses, which required that your grandfather have voted for you to be allowed to vote. Right? And you can clearly see why um, a freedman in 1870 could not possibly provide proof that his grandfather had voted because his grandfather wouldn't have been able to vote. So these different measures made it um, essentially impossible for an African American to vote in the South during this era. And once again, in many areas of the North as well. Um, and this, once again, wasn't just in those areas. Further, furthermore, happens in the workplace um, where African Americans were immediately put back um, in what the Redeemers believed to be their place. The Redeemers saw them as farmhands, and the legislation quickly um, emerges that finds a way to put newly freedmen back onto farms. And these were essentially mainly sharecropping and tenant farming cropland systems that took advantage of African Americans or freedmen and made sure that they were forced to stay on farms and were not able to leave. These industrial jobs were really only op offered in many cases to um, Southern whites. So the response to this initially comes very strongly primarily from African Americans, um, both individuals and groups. Remember, many whites in the North um, seem to be very tired of the abolitionist cause and have kind of removed themselves from this. And African Americans now have come to the forefront of um, the issues regarding to African American treatments. Um, and so that happens on a couple different fronts, like African American black churches really push for this, new entrepreneurs, those that have been successful in the North, uh, social and service organizations, interest groups, lobbying groups, like the NAACP um, really pu pushes for this. And individuals like W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells, Henry McNeil Turner um, are all going to push for the equality of African Americans, both in the North and the South. Um, you'll read... Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Compromise tonight as well for a PD, and that's in many ways a response to that, a speech that he gives um, to an almost all-white organization. So pay attention to that as his response um, to what's going on in the Atlanta Compromise. And I think you'll find that it's a little different than what, what might have happened um, from W.E.B. Du Bois. So ultimately, the quest question we have to ask ourselves is, was the South really new? Right? Did Henry Grady's idea of a new industrial South really come, to, come true? I mean, to some extent, yeah, the South is starting to industrialize, uh, but socially, culturally, are there any shifts? Are there any changes? 
right? Politically, we see a return once again of the same groups back to power. Sharecropping and cropland systems maintain that freedmen are once again forced to work on a plantation, and the plantation owners maintain political and economic power. Um, the new, some of the wealthy people now aren't just plantation owners, it's now factory owners who are able to take advantage of poor whites in the South. So um, as a whole, the South in many ways returns exactly back to the way it was. And the question we have to ask ourselves as historians is who do we blame for that? Right? Is this the northern government's fault? Um, what would have been different if Lincoln had survived? Could we have, should the Freedmen's Bureau have been able to do more? Did we end Reconstruction too soon? Was Reconstruction too radical to start with? Um, who is truly to blame for all of this and for the South not being able to catch up? Because the impacts of that um, are long withstanding, and you can see those even through to today in 2016. So thanks for watching, folks. Much love. I'll see you all in class.